Why are so many of us drawn to the morbid and the macabre? In the past few years, a fascination with dark tourism has boomed in popularity, as thrill seekers flock to locations known for death and tragedy. Talking about serial killers and visiting these locations is a way to get in touch with your innermost fears, and it can even make you braver. For many of us dark tourists, we have seen enough graveyards, gothic churches, and catacombs to last a lifetime, and we want something more. So our channel has put together 10 dark tourism locations, the Serial Killers Edition. My name is Sheesh Merriweather, the founder of Crime Viral Online, and today I'll be doing what I do best, which is talking about serial killers. But before we start our countdown, here is a special treat for all you true crime fans. Magellan TV is a new type of documentary streaming membership founded by filmmakers. Their team of producers and curators brings together premium content that dives deep into important documentary subjects. Magellan TV has some of the best collections available in true crime, history, science, nature and space. There are so many great choices, it's hard to stop watching once you start. There are over 3,000 documentaries to choose from and new programs are added on a weekly basis. Even better, there's a growing selection of shows available in 4K without a Additional cost. You can watch Magellan TV on any device or connected TV. You can even cast from your phone to your TV. It's super easy to use. So check it out now. Click the link below to get a full month free. I've just finished watching Death on the Matterhorn. Seven men climb to the summit of Matterhorn, a mountain in the Alps. Then they are hit with a disaster when a rope snaps and four men fall to their death. But did the rope snap or was it cut? If you like your murder mysteries set at 14,000 feet above the ground, this documentary with gripping reenactments filmed at the original locations is the one for you. Now let's get you back to the serial killers. Before his execution, Ted Bundy confessed to the murders of 30 women and teenage girls between 1974 and 1978. Bundy murdered and dismembered his victims in many states, including Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Utah, and Colorado. Many dark tourists who find Bundy fascinating may come across videos online of Ted Bundy's cellar, just outside of Salt Lake City in a place called Emigration Canyon. This is an underground pit that's heavily graffitied and allegedly was once owned by Bundy himself. But there is no record of this serial killer ever visiting or owning the cellar. These often shared horror stories that he dumped the bodies of the victims here is a dark tourism myth. The real cellar is at Ted Bundy's former boarding house. Number 10. Located at 565 First Avenue, Salt Lake City in Utah, Bundy lived here from September of 1974 to October of 1975 while attending the nearby law school. All the Google Street View links for the following locations will be in the video description below, so if any of these places aren't accessible for you, you can go on a virtual tour instead. Bundy lived in room two in this five bedroom house, which has since been renamed to room five. His former room faces the front of this idyllic tree-lined street, and there is a fire escape which apparently he used to come and go undetected. During the time he roomed here, he was an active serial killer. He is believed to have taken four of his victims in Utah to this house. Following his arrest, both the utility room and the cellar located under the house were searched by police. At this location, you can walk down the same street as one of the most notorious and twisted serial killers of all time. But don't forget the three rules of dark tourism. Number one, always ask permission before exploring a location. Number two, always keep safe. And number three, take lots of photos. So in at number nine, we have the LaLaurie Mansion, located at Royal Street in the French Quarter in New Orleans. This is the former home of Madame Delphine LaLaurie, who was born into wealth and also married well, yet her first two husbands died under suspicious circumstances. Her third marriage to a much younger man was also turbulent. The true horrors that took place at this mansion were eventually uncovered 
when the house was set ablaze in 1834. The fire itself had been ignited by a cook who was chained to the oven in the kitchen. She set the blaze so she could expose Lalaurie. The cook said that seven of the slaves had been taken to a room at the very top and were never seen again. When the top room of the house was investigated, they found seven slaves, more or less horribly mutilated, suspended by their neck, with their limbs apparently stretched and torn from one extremity to the other. Looking through the funeral registers at the time, it's believed that 12 slaves were tortured and murdered at this mansion between 1830 and 1834. LaLaurie's mansion was burned to the ground by an angry mob and she fled the country. Now many people ask, can you actually go inside the house? The short answer is no, as the mansion is currently privately owned by composer Michael Whelan, but don't give up all hope as there's 60 bars in the French Quarter and you might bump into the owner, buy him a beer and ask him, can I go and have a look around your creepy murder mansion? Worth a try. If you are looking for somewhere to stay in New Orleans and you want to extend your dark tourism visit, there is also St. Vincent's Infant Asylum in the Garden District, which was first built in 1861. This building is now a hostel and many guests who have been brave enough to stay here claim to see the ghosts of dead children playing in the hallways. And also in the night, you can hear the sound of children laughing. The place is actually under renovations at the moment and will be reopened in spring of 2021. So what have we got next for you? In at number eight, it's cannibalistic serial killers, of course. Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment in room 213 in the Oxford apartment building at North 25th Street, Milwaukee, is where the cannibalistic serial killer committed 12 of the murders. Inside the apartment, swarms of flies hovered around several corpses. A pan on the stove contained human brains. Hands and feet had been boiled in another pan and three human heads had been found in the fridge. All the police officers who first came across this crime scene had to undergo specialist counseling to recover properly from the horrors of what they saw. Dahmer was arrested in 1991 and the apartment building was demolished a year later after several tenants vacated the premises and unsurprisingly, nobody really wanted to live there anymore. There is however the house where it all began. So at number eight, we have Jeffrey Dahmer's childhood home. Located on Bath Road in Ohio, this is where Dahmer grew up with his parents and his younger brother David. His morbid fascination with skulls and other animal bones started very early on in Dharma's childhood. His parents would argue constantly and to escape from that reality, he would roam these country roads looking for roadkill he could collect. One former neighbor recalled that Dharma had a graveyard in his house with animals buried in it, and the skulls of the animals were placed on little crosses. Following his parents' divorce, Dharma was left alone in the house, and in the summer of 1978, he picked up hitchhiker Stephen Hicks and brought him back to the family home where he killed him by strangling him with a barbell. Dharma hid the body under the crawl space of this home and the next day he went out and bought a knife, he cut off the arms and legs and he also kept the head of Hicks, which he took to his bedroom to admire. Following his arrest, police recovered more than 50 pieces of bone from the grounds of this property. In 2005, the house was sold for a quarter of a million to musician Chris Butler, who formed the rock band The Waitresses, and he did allow the filming of My Friend Dharma to take place here too. Now we're moving further up north to Canada, in at number seven, Robert Picton's Pig Farm. Located on Dominion Avenue in Port Coquitlam in British Columbia, this is the location where serial killer Robert Picton is believed to have killed 49 women. He lured the victims who were mostly sex workers from Vancouver's red light district to this farm. In the late 90s and early noughties, there was many reports of women going missing, but Picton managed to escape police detection because Vancouver police had next to nothing. No witness reports, no bodies, no physical evidence. 
Then in 2002, Picton was arrested when police, acting on a warrant for firearm violations, found the personal belongings of a missing woman on the farm. They obtained a second court order to continue the search and what they found was horrific. There were several skulls, hands, feet and bloody clothing belonging to the victims discovered here. Later, Picton bragged that he had killed the victims by strangling them. He then bled and gutted them, ran them through a wood chipper and fed their remains to his pigs. This location is now known as Canada's Ground Zero as the entire grounds had to be excavated so police could search for human remains. Pictum is currently serving a life sentence and at the time this video is published he is 71 years old. Another creepy fact about the farm is a decade before the murders took place, Picton and his brother David held wild parties at a converted barn near the pig farm, which they called the Piggy Palace. The parties were soon shut down for violating zoning laws, but, well, I don't even want to think about what horror show went down at a party hosted by a serial killer in a barn called Piggy Palace. Ugh. Next on our list in at number six is Dennis Nilsson's apartment. Located at Cranley Gardens in Muswell Hill, North London. This is where the serial killer Nilsson lived with his pet dog Bleep in the attic apartment. Often labelled the British Jeffrey Dahmer, Nilsson murdered and dismembered at least 12 young men between 1978 and 1983. He invited the intended victims back to his apartment where they enjoyed drinks together and listened to music. But when the victims tried to leave, they would see a different side to their new friend they'd just met. He would strangle them to death and some victims were also drowned. Nilsson had a strict ritual after the killings. He would strip and bathe the victims and then dispose of them on a bonfire or stuff them into bags under the floorboards or flush the remains down the toilet. These horrific crimes were undetected until his neighbours complained about the block drains. When a plumber arrived at the house to investigate, he found a flesh-like blockage and bones. The police were called to take a look at this disturbing discovery and they asked to look around Nilsson's home. Inside his apartment, the smell of rotting flesh was overwhelming. Nilsson calmly confessed that the smell was the pile of dead bodies and there was also still one in the closet. The apartment was last sold in 2015 to the two lucky owners who clearly didn't mind the whole bodies under the floorboards thing or the fact that their bathroom probably has the most haunted toilet in the whole of London. Let us know in the comments if you have visited any of these creepy locations and don't forget to like and subscribe as our next video we will finish off this macabre list of dark tourism locations. But for now, enjoy your morbid tours and keep it creepy everybody.